Hello, everyone. I'm Sierra. And I'm Ashley. And this is your Weekly Weekly Dose of Wicked. (laughs) On this day of podcastmas, my favorite podcasters gave to me 12 poisonings, 11 eyeball pluckings, 10 sleepless weekends, 9 missing hobos, 8 awkward dates, 7 medical malpractices, 6 southern stabbings, 5 golden rings. A quadruple homicide, a few cryptic notes, two teenage dirtbags, and a lunatic ex-husband. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful night of podcast mass. That was beautiful. I, I thought so. I thought it was like opera worthy. <laughs> so anyway, welcome to day 10 of podcast mass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woohoo! Only two more days. Only two more days to go, and we're going to record all of them tonight. Yeah! I'm so excited. Same. Same seas. So anyway, big news in the world of Weekly Dose of Wicked. How was that? Could you hear me? Yeah. Booyah, buddies! I'm in business. All right. So my husband is a child, therefore he cannot wait until Christmas morning to give me my presents. So I said, I've got to go record the podcast, and he said, oh, I bought you a heater to keep you warm in the garage. Will you open it? It's actually a new microphone. Woohoo! Go, Jacob. So now I'll quit bitching about how my mic sucks. So there we go. I'm now in business with a Samson Q2U microphone. He spoils you. Mm, sometimes. Sometimes. He tries to spoil me. Most of the time, he's a pretty horrible gift giver. But I think this year, he did pretty good. Did he give you all your gifts? No, Ashley. He only gave me this one. Okay. I shook the other one real good, but couldn't figure out what it was. Well, you should have two more. I do have two more, but I know what the other one is because I literally sent him the link for it. Okay. No, I literally sent him the link for the item. There was then a charge to my bank account for the website, and it then arrived quite quickly in a bag that was not secretive in any way, shape, or form. So (laughs) I know what that gift is. I also knew what this gift was because even though he was trying to be all like, <laughs> I got you a heater to keep your feet warm. He um, actually, yesterday I was looking at the microphones and he was like, you should just wait until after Christmas. Just wait until after the holidays. Just get through the holidays and then worry about buying a microphone. So I was like, oh yeah, he totally bought me a mic. Yeah. I mean, he is pretty predictable, but he tries. He does try. So anyway, back to it. Day 10 of podcast, miss. Um, I'm going to sing the jingle. On the 10th, no, I'm sorry, that was horrible. <clears throat> I can do better. On the 10th day of podcast mess, my favorite podcasters, is it my? I don't even know the jingle anymore. On the I don't know, ten- you say your, I say my. I don't know, it doesn't matter. On the 10th day of podcast mess, your favorite podcasters gave to you 10 sleepless weekends. Is that right? Sleepless weekends? I don't know, we yeah. named them. I think okay. so. I think so. All right, moving along. So we're going to talk about sleepless weekends. <clears throat> Let's jump into it. I got to. I got to tell you, as much as we've been hating on podcast miss, the shortness of the episodes make them really easy to edit. So even though I'm literally editing an episode every single night, I've gotten it down to where I can do like a whole episode in like three hours. That's great. I'm going to miss that. This is not going to be one of those episodes. I hope that you brought your comfy clothes because this is like eight pages long. Oh, my God. (laughs) Just letting you know now. So all the complaining you want to do is fine. I still got to edit the whole thing. I'm probably going to be up until tomorrow. Yeah, 100%. For sure. Because it's already 11. And we have two more episodes to record. Yeah. And I've got to record. I mean, I've got to edit the whole thing. So, yeah. Anyway, it's fine. It's cool. Whatever. We're just going to. I'm on my 97th cup of coffee today. Not really. But do you know how many boxes of K-Cups I've bought this month? How many? I don't know. But I've bought five in the past, like, four days. 12 packs. And have you went through all of them? I'm sorry. Yesterday, I bought a new box. When I bought the new box, I had five left from the 24 I had bought the day before. I think I'm down to like eight now. So yeah, I mean, I've been drinking a lot of coffee. Yeah, I mean, I've drank more energy drinks than I probably ever have in my life. Like coffee's not even doing it for me anymore. And I'm not even editing. Well, I don't even have energy drinks. I actually was going to... That's why I asked you how long you were going to be because I was going to go to the store. But you were too... You didn't respond. And then you were like, okay, I'm home. So I did respond. No, it was like 30 minutes, though. I was like, hey, how long are you going to be? And then you responded like, oh, we're cashing out. And it had been 30 minutes. And so I was like, okay, they'll be home in a few minutes. And then it was like 20 minutes later. If the bartender will get our attention. So, I mean, I could have went to the store. I think your timeline is a little dramatic there. 
I don't, but it's okay. We got to get into this. Are you ready? Ready. I want to talk to you about a man named Milton Johnson. Milton was born May 15th, 1950 in Joliet, Illinois. He is the middle of three children. His parents divorced when he was just four years old. Other than that, though, very little is known about Milton's early life. What we do know is that he dropped out of high school. Um, he then committed his first violent crime in 1970 at just 19 years old. So we're just going to jump right on into these crimes. Disclaimer, uh, sexual assault is heavy in this case. So just want to throw that out there. On February 15th, 1970, a young couple was approached while in their vehicle by Milton Johnson. He knocked on the passenger window and made small talk with the couple before pulling a gun and forcing the young woman into the back seat of the car. He then raped her and tortured her while the woman's boyfriend sat in the front seat helpless. He used the car's cigarette lighter to burn her genitals. He also hit her so hard that he broke her jaw. Ooh, I don't like this. No, and I just went, I just went right in. like Yeah, pshh. no warning. No. I did. I gave you a warning. I told you sexual assault, and then I talked about burning her genitals. So. I didn't like that. Can I continue? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when he had finished, he exited the car and told the young man that he intended to shoot and kill both of them. His goal was to shoot them both with the same bullet. He really wanted to do that. I don't know why. Um, at this point, the young man made a run for it, knowing that this was his only chance. Uh, that was not part of Milton's plan. So this obviously startled Milton. He panicked. He took off in the couple's car with the young woman still in the backseat. He drove to a local hospital and dropped the woman off for help. So I didn't expect that to be the turn of events. I expected to, him to get startled, to kill the woman, dump her. But he did not. She survived. Uh, he was pretty quickly identified, though. And he was then found guilty and sentenced to 25 years in prison. So it was for aggravated assault and rape. Well, that's good. Yeah, uh, it would be good, except for he would be eligible for parole in 1986, which was just 16 years. But they actually decided that he was fit to be released even earlier than that. Uh, the prison system did not see him as a sexually threatening individual. After being denied parole four times, they decided that he was good to go. And so on March 10th, 1983, Milton Johnson was paroled, and that would uh, prove to be a horrible decision. I mean, clearly, we're talking about him. So he spent 13 years, 13 years in prison when he was sentenced to 25, depending on the source, 25 to 35. But either way, it's like he only served half of his minimum sentence. Hmm. So, yeah. All right. Uh just three months after his release from prison, Milton would go on a crazy killing spree. Three months? Three months after being released from prison, yes. He was released in March 10th of 1983. His first uh, his first murder is like June 25th. But he has some things that go on even sooner than that. But yeah, I mean, it's literally three months after he gets released. Um, and over the course of two and a half months, Milton Johnson would kill at least 10 people in Will County, Illinois. Oh my gosh. That being said... Let's jump on into the weekend murder. On June 17th, 1983, Teresa McKean was driving home from work when a truck pulled up next to her on the highway. She thought the truck was going to pass her, but when he continued to drive next to her, she applied the brakes. The truck then slowed down and once again was driving next to Teresa. At that point, her driver's side window exploded as she heard a loud bang. She wasn't exactly sure what had happened, but the truck took off. At this point, she just wanted to get home, so Teresa McKean pulled herself together and continued her drive. As she drove, though, she saw the same truck up ahead parked on the side of the road, and the driver was now outside of the truck, waving a gun around and yelling at her. She now realized that her window had been shot out. Terrified, Teresa decided to just floor it and just try and get past this man waving a gun in the middle of the road. Uh, he did then shoot at her four more times, missing her vehicle. So not a very good shot. No. Um, as soon as Teresa got home, she called the police and filed a report about the incident. She told the officers that she had seen two men in the truck, but the one standing in the road was a heavyset African-American male with short hair. She described the truck as a dark pickup truck. Uh, state troopers would then go out and patrol the stretch of highway that Teresa had taken home that night. It was only about five miles, so it wasn't very much for him to cover. Um, and they did actually come across a truck matching Teresa's description. The truck was currently pulled over on the shoulder of the road, and the driver was outside of the vehicle, which is really weird since that's exactly what Teresa had described. They questioned the driver of this truck, and they also checked his ID. The man was Milton Johnson. But the state trooper let him go because Teresa said that she thought there were two men in the truck that had shot at her, and this truck only had one. So they caught him and let him go. Yeah, essentially, they didn't think it was him, so they just let him go. Hmm. Uh, once again, this would be a huge mistake. While Teresa was lucky, others were not. All right, so Milton's murdering spree started on Saturday, June 25th, 1983, when he murdered two elderly sisters. Honora Lehman 
and Zeta Blue. Uh, my article or my source said they were both 68. It, I don't know if they were twins or if they were just uh, Irish twins. Is that what they're called when they're like 11 months apart? But either way, apparently they were sisters that were the same age. Okay. So the sisters had been shot and stabbed and their bodies had been burned post-mortem. Hmm. Yeah. You didn't like that? You didn't like that little? No, I didn't. This guy sucks already. Yeah, that little wince that you made. Uh, on July 1st, so that was what I say, June 25th. So July 1st, the very next weekend, ju- just to let you know, June 25th, 1983 was a Saturday. Okay. Hence the weekend murder. Uh, July 1st was also a Saturday. So on July 1st, the ne- very next weekend, Milton would abduct and kill Terry Johnson, a wife and mother. When Terry's husband, Eric Johnson, came home from work, he noticed that Terry wasn't there, but he knew that she had plans with friends that evening, and so he wasn't immediately alarmed. That is until she wasn't home the next morning. When Terry still had not returned home by 5 p.m. the next day, Eric went out looking for her himself and quickly came across her abandoned van. Okay. At this point, Eric immediately went to report Terry missing to the police department. Uh, Not only was it not like her to just not come home, but their son's first birthday was the next day, and she would not have missed that. That's really sad. This was alarming. Um, In another part of town, a woman named Anna Chancellor was experiencing a similar situation. Her husband, Kenneth Chancellor, had left on the evening of July 1st and not returned the following day. So both uh, Kenneth Chancellor and, I'm sorry, Terry Johnson both went missing on the same day. Very quickly, they were also able to locate Kenneth's vehicle as it had been towed. It had uh, had also been left abandoned, so they towed it. Uh, when they searched his car, they found blood in the floorboard. They also found a handwritten note to Kenneth from Athena. Who's Athena? I, I thought you might be wondering who Athena is. They later learned that Terry Johnson would often go by the alias Athena McCall. So they then deduced that Kenneth Chancellor and Terry Johnson were most likely having an affair. Okay. The bodies of Kenneth Chancellor and Terry Johnson will be found, um, although they were not found in the same location. So maybe they were wrong about the affair. So that was just like speculation? Yes, but actually they were probably right about the affair because although their bodies were not found together, uh, it was determined that they had been shot and killed by the same bullet. Like you wanted to do before. Something that he wanted to do, yes. Uh, Terry had been shot first through the back, went into her chest, out her breast, and the bullet then entered the chest of Kenneth and traveled through his heart where it then got lodged in his hip. In his hip? In his hip. I don't know how that happened, but that's what it said. Okay. I'm not sure. That's what it said. On Saturday, July 16th, so two weeks after that previous murder, uh, Milton Johnson struck yet again on a Saturday. While driving his truck, he lightly rear-ended another car to force them to come to a stop. When the other car pulled over, Milton shot Kathleen Norwood, age 25, and Richard Paulin, age 32. At that point, unfortunately, he was disturbed by a set of sheriff deputies. Oh, he was disturbed. The deputies thought that his truck had gotten stuck, and they were pulling over to assist him. Unfortunately, Milton would then shoot and kill Deputy Stephen Mayer, age 22. He also shot at Sergeant Dennis Foley, age 50, shooting him in the throat but not killing him. Sergeant Foley was able to make it back to the squad car where he attempted to radio for help. Unfortunately, due to the blood that was pooling in his throat from the gunshot wound, dispatch only heard gargling on the other end. Uh, They instructed him to turn on his lights and sirens if he needed help, which he then did. Um, At this point, Milton was busy moving Deputy Meyer's body. I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor's body out of the middle of the street where he had shot and killed him. Uh, Luckily for Sergeant Foley, though, a car was approaching, so he stood and waved for help. But as he did that, Milton then began shooting at the newly approaching car. Milton then um, shoots and kills George Keel, age 24, who was driving this newly approaching car. He also wounded the passenger of the car, Laura Troutman, age 21. Now, while Laura had been shot six times. Oh, my gosh. She was able to get away. It's insane, right? It's a lot of shots. Yeah. She got shot six times and she got out of the car and ran for help. Hmm. That's pretty crazy. Yes. Uh, Sergeant Foley would end up succumbing to his injuries after spending nearly a month in the hospital on life support. So at this point, Milton's victims um, were up to nine in just four weeks. He's killed nine people in four weeks. That's pretty crazy. It's a lot of bodies. Not to mention he's also injured Laura Troutman. He's also essentially stalked Teresa McKean. So, yes, he's killed nine people, but he's terrorized 11. Right. Moving on from there. Uh, I lost my place because I had to scroll up. I'm sorry. Um, All of these deaths are obviously heartbreaking, but I just want to make note that the two members of the sheriff's office were actually auxiliary sheriffs. 
So from what I can tell, that means that they were not like full-time sheriffs. They were backups. So they actually volunteered their time um, running a safety patrol on the weekends. Oh, that's worse. Yeah. So they actually were just out there like trying to make sure that the place was safe, um, that Joliet was safe. They did have service weapons on them, but like they weren't out there catching hardened criminals. Like they were just out there helping cars that had broken down, maybe stopping people from doing graffiti, you know, vandals, like that kind of stuff. They were not out there. Right, small. Stuff. Yeah. They, I mean, they were volunteers. So I just thought that made it a lot sadder. Uh, on July 17th, Milton Johnson found Anthony Hackett and Patricia Payne, both 18 years old, parked and sleeping in a car. Uh, you'll notice that that's literally the day after the five murders that he just committed. We're now on July 17th. The other murders were July 16th. Yeah, that's quick. Yeah, but um, in my professional opinion, I couldn't find times on this, but it actually seems like it was only a matter of hours between the two instances. Because the five murders on July 16th were at night. These murders on July 17th appear to be very early morning. And we'll mm -hmm. see why. So the young couple had driven to Six Flags the day before. So they'd driven to Six Flags July 16th. They had spent the day there. And then they'd left the park at 10 p.m. when they closed. And they were driving back home. They'd gotten tired. So they pulled over to get some sleep. And then they were going to finish driving in the morning. So that's why I say it seems as though it was very early morning. Right. Milton knocked on the passenger window of the car to wake the couple up. He then shot Anthony to death. Why did he have to wake them up first? I don't know. That's what I, because he's a psychopath. Clearly. So I just want to tell you now, it's 10 sleepless weekends. So it makes you think there's 10 victims. That's how this is all played out. He has so many victims, I lost count. So it's like 10 weekends, not 10 victims. No, it's not even 10 weekends. It's not even 10 weekends either. I mean, I guess kind of. I guess if you start at July 17th or whatever it was, June 17th, then yeah, I guess it is 10 weekends. But no, like he's listed as only having 10 victims. I don't see where they came up with that number, though. I talk about it at the end. Okay. I don't know where they came up with that number. I really don't. Yeah, I mean, I've we're at 10 now, right? Yes. We're at, I mean, depends on what you're considering a victim. Right now we're at 10 murders. Right. But we're at like 13 victims. Because you've got the first victim. I mean, I feel like that first woman was his victim, that he raped and broke her jaw. Oh, yeah, she was, but I just meant, like, killing victims. Right. So if you're only... if you're only like Ten murders. We're at if, ten murders. Yes, we're at ten murders. I would say 13 victims. But yes. Okay. Anyway. So he knocks on the window, wakes them up, shoots Anthony to death in the car. He then forces Patricia out of the car and into his truck, he, where he then gags her with a rag, blindfolds her... And makes her crouch down on the floorboard. He drove for some time before pulling over where he would then rape Patricia in his truck. He then, when he was finished, drove some more uh, before pulling over and forcing Patricia out of the truck. Where he then stabbed her and left her for dead on the side of the interstate. Yeah, this dude sucks. Yes. Um, around 5 a.m., Patricia was found alive, but obviously injured by Ray Tusick, which was a motorist who just so happened to be driving the interstate. He was on his way to go fishing. Um, he saw something on the side of the road and he turned around because he wasn't sure what it was. I don't, I don't know if he thought it was a body, what his reasoning was, but he turned around to go check and see what it was. Thankfully. Uh, he asked Patricia, like if she could get up and walk to his car, she couldn't. A few minutes later, David Sims Jr. also pulled over seeing Ray Tusick and Patricia Payne on the side of the highway. The two men then carried Patricia to Ray's car and both took Patricia to the closest police station. This was the 80s, so they didn't have cell phones. So that was the quickest way to get her help, was just to drive to a, to a police station. Makes sense. So with six dead and two injured in a matter of literally hours, police realize that they have a very big issue on their hands. Um, the only evidence that they're able to come up with, though, from the two scenes are a size 11 shoe print, a handwritten receipt from a local tackle shop with the name Sam Myers on it, and then they've got statements from these two traumatized women. And these are both very quick statements because both of these women are severely injured. Like both of them need emergency surgery. So they literally just take statements from them as they're on their way in for surgery. So very quick statements. Um, Patricia described her attacker as a heavyset African-American male with short hair. And Laura Troutman from the night before, uh, she described two attackers, one of which is very clearly Sergeant Foley. So Laura actually thought that the police are who shot them because in a matter of seconds, the car pulled up, Officer Foley, or Sergeant Foley, stood up waving his arms for help. One thing said help. The other one said like he was waving his arms telling him to stop because it wasn't safe for him to keep coming. Either way, though, he stood up waving his arms and then immediately 
bullets started flying. So she actually thought that Sergeant Foley shot them. Okay. So her first, um, I don't know the word I was looking for. Her first perpetrator was Sergeant Foley. The second that she described was a heavy set African American male with short hair. Uh, police would obviously start investigating these murders right away, but they wouldn't get far uh, before Milton would strike yet again. On August 20th, 1983, so this is about a month later, Anna Ryan, her daughter-in-law, Pamela Ryan, and a friend, Barbara Dunbar, went to Greenware by Mary, a pottery store in Joliet owned by Marilyn Bears. The three women arrived at the store around 11.15 a.m., but when Edna Hawk entered the same store at noon, it was completely empty. Edna was concerned for Marilyn's safety, so she left the store and flagged down a sheriff who just happened to be driving by. Two deputies entered Greenware by Mary, but they also found no signs of the shop owner. Um, they began to search the store. They checked the back room, and when they switched the lights on, they found all four women had been stabbed to death in the back room. What was that face about? It's just, this dude sucks. Yeah. He just stabbed him. Like, yeah, he stabbed them, all four of them. Um, autopsies would reveal the four women had been stabbed a combined 43 times. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, Anna had also been shot in the neck. I don't know. I've never heard of this guy. No, there's, like, nothing on this dude either. Like, I mean, I know this seems like a lot of information, but, like, I, this is all from literally two articles. That's crazy. Yeah. <sighs> so, anyway, um, the murderer had stolen the women's purses. He'd also taken Anna's car, which would later be found at a local car wash. Initially, Marilyn's son would be the lead suspect. He had a criminal record. He was also a known user of drugs. Uh, but he had a solid alibi, so pretty quickly they released him as a suspect. Something really sad about this one, too, um, is that Marilyn Bayer was actually in the process of moving her shop to another town. It was literally days away from closing and moving to another town. Yeah, that does suck. Mm -hmm. uh, a woman named Anna Shoemaker called Will County, Illinois, in August of 1983. I don't know if I mentioned that before. All of these took place in Will County. Essentially, all of them took place right around Joliet, which is in Will County. Right. Mm, Anna Shoemaker said that she was driving home with a friend when a dark uh, pickup truck pulled up next to her on the highway. She said that they played a little bit of cat and mouse before the, tr the truck attempted to take off. She claims that she then followed the truck and took down the license plate number, which she then gave to the police. When police look up this license plate number, they see that it uh, is registered to a truck, which is registered to one Sam Myers. Does that name ring a bell for you? Yes, it does. Okay. Well, you're just not giving me anything here, Ash. Well, I'm just, my mind is being blown and I just can't. <laughs> so they also had that receipt from a tackle shop for uh, Mr. Sam Myers. So they head on down to Sam's house to figure out what's going on. When they arrived, they saw a dark truck parked out front. They also saw a man outside who matched the description given by multiple living victims. This man was Milton Johnson. And Sam Myers was his stepdaddy. Hmm. So they asked Milton if he'd ever drove that truck. And he said sometimes on the weekends when uh, Sam would allow him to. After questioning both Sam and Dolly Myers, which was Milton's mother, they determined that Sam was not a suspect as he and Dolly had alibis during all of the murders. They had been out of town. Like they had rock solid alibis. So it wasn't Sam. Um, interestingly enough, though, after that visit from law enforcement, the murder stopped. That is interesting. Mm hmm. Also, interestingly enough, that truck disappeared from Sam Meyer's house. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if S Milton got rid of it. Uh, no. Sam actually later said that he did not believe that Milton was involved. Where'd you get rid of your truck then, Sam? I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you his reasoning. He said he did not believe that Milton was involved. But because he had recently been let out of prison, he knew that Milton was an easy suspect. So he was just trying to do whatever he could to help his stepson. He didn't want for them just to put the blame on him because he was easy. Which I could see, but like, he's, it seems he's pretty good for these murders, Sam. And what does getting rid of your truck have to do with anything if he didn't actually do it? Yeah, so my next line was, unfortunately, all Sam did was make Milton look more guilty. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, since Milton was, you know, like a criminal who had done time in prison, his fingerprints were on file. So they start the investigation by running his prints against any of the prints that they picked up from the crime scenes. Now, they only had prints from the pottery store and from Anna Ryan's car. There weren't any prints at any of the other locations. Uh, first of all, those sisters, their bodies had been burned. Their bodies had been burned because he lit the whole house on fire. So any prints that were there were most likely destroyed. Um, 
Patricia and Anthony, he never, I mean, he, I guess, knocked on the window, but he didn't touch anything. He just shot him. So, again, no fingerprints would have been there. Uh, the five that he killed out in the middle of the street, again, there's no, nowhere for him to leave fingerprints. So, he had fingerprints. There were fingerprints at the pottery store and at, in Anna Ryan's car. Um, so, I lost my locate. Oh, okay. So, it turns out that Milton Johnson's prints are a match. On March 8th, Milton shows up for a check-in with his parole officer because he's still on parole at this point for, you know, the raping of the woman back in 1970. He's just been let out of prison at this point five months ago. So he shows up at his parole officer's office for a meeting, uh, and he actually ends up getting questioned by police for his involvement in the murders of Anna Ryan, Pamela Ryan, Barbara Dunbar, and Marilyn Bears. He, of course, denies ever even being in the pottery store. Um, but police have his fingerprints at the scene of the crime. But Milton says they must have been planted there. How are people planting your fingerprints? Well, the police say it's interesting because his fingerprints that are in Anna Ryan's car, um, they're actually in the victim's blood. So pretty impossible to plant fingerprints in blood in a victim's car. Right. Unless you were um, there. Right. Yeah. So obviously at that point they arrest Milton Johnson. Um, for the murder of the four women, at least. Like, they've got him for those. They then took Milton's mugshot and they showed it to Patricia Payne, who positively identified him as the man who had attacked her. Um, now that they had Milton in custody, they approached Sam Myers. They asked if they could search his truck. He did give them permission. I think at that point, he probably realized, like, oh, maybe he did do this. Uh, so when they searched the truck, they found long blonde hairs that belonged to Patricia Payne in the floorboard. They found a steak knife, and they also found a receipt from Six Flags dated for July 16th, which is the same date Patricia Payne and Anthony Hackett were there. So, so he went to Six Flags, or it's their receipt from Six Flags? It's their receipt. He stole Anthony's wallet. Oh, okay. Is what they are saying, is that he stole his wallet. I was like, wallet. what a psycho. He went to Six Flags and then murdered people? <laughs> no, he murdered five people the day before. Remember? He didn't have time to go to Six Flags. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. No. They're saying that it was Anthony and Patricia's receipt. Okay. So now that they found this evidence in the truck, they got a search warrant for Sam and Dolly Meyer's home to search Milton's bedroom, where they found three 357 Magnum cartridges hidden in a dresser drawer. Um, these matched the bullets found at the pottery store. So, Because like I said, Anna was shot in the neck, so that matched the bullet there. They also found a pair of size 11 Converse All-Stars that matched the footprints at the pottery store. If, if you will recall, size 11 footprints were also found at the scene of that massacre on July 16th. Of all the people. Yeah, with the two officers and the four innocent bystanders. Right. So, although they had a ton of evidence on the Pottery Store murders, for some reason, the initial trial would only carry charges relating to the murder of Anthony Hackett and the rape and attempted murder of Patricia Pay. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that's because maybe they thought, I don't know. I don't know what the reasoning is for that. Because I feel like the Pottery Store is a 100, like, there's no shadow of doubt on that. You've got bloody fingerprints. You've got matching shell casings. Like... You've got fingerprints in the car as well as in the store. I don't know why they didn't go for that one first. Because I feel like that one is for sure like a definite. Right. Did they want to just try them separately? I guess that must have been it. Like maybe they were worried that one of them wouldn't have enough evidence. I don't know. But I just thought that was kind of weird. But anyway, whatever. So it goes, it, it gets set to go to trial. The day before the trial is set to start, Milton's stepdad and mother hire a lawyer. So initially it was supposed to be a public defender. They hire a lawyer the day before. I think it was like maybe a way to kind of try and slow down the trial. I'm not really sure. Uh, but Milton's new lawyer actually requests three continuances. So the trial doesn't actually begin until, until July 26th of 1984. So it's been delayed like two months almost by this yeah, point. That's a long time. Yeah. Uh, given the substantial evidence against Milton, there really wasn't much of it. So I don't really know why. Milton's parents wasted money on an attorney. Uh, the defense attorney, really, the only argument that he had is that Patricia didn't mention that the truck that she was taken in had a crack in the windshield. And Milton's, I'm sorry, Sam Meyer's truck had a cracked windshield. But she didn't mention there was a cracked windshield when she was taken. So it must not have been the same truck. Oh, okay. Yeah, pretty stupid. So Milton Johnson maybe would end up... she was under a lot of trauma and didn't remember... Or maybe she didn't see windshield. the windshield. Maybe she didn't see the windshield. She was, so, she was on the floorboard. Right. Because he made her, like, crouch down. And he blindfolded her. Right. Stupidest defense I've ever heard. Actually, that's not true. It's not the stupidest not the stupidest defense I've ever heard. It's not even the stupidest defense in this case. We'll continue. Okay. So, <laughs> Milton Johnson would be found guilty and given the death penalty. On August 20th, 1984, so about a year later, right? Is that where we are? I think. Sounds right. I think we're a year later, are we? No, we're not a year later. We're a month later. I'm sorry. I don't know why I said a year. We're a month later. That... 
July 26, 1984 was the first trial. That was about a year after the murders. This is now a month after that first trial. So August 20th, 1984, Milton was brought back to trial to face charges related to the Pottery Store murder. So now they want to try him for those. Um, it was almost certain that he was once again going to be found guilty. Uh, and in true trash bag fashion, after firing his public defenders not once but twice, Milton Johnson decided to defend himself in court. I knew it. <laughs> when I read that, I was like, yes. I just love it. I, I love, love it. it. I love Stupid. it. I love it. Because you know why I love it? Because when somebody decides to defend themselves in court, that means that their attorney has told them, there is no way I'm going to get you out of this. And so the yeah. idiot murderer has said, hold my beer. And then they fail epically every time. That is true. That is that true. is what that means. When they when they decide to defend themselves, it is because their attorney has told them, you have to take a plea deal. Like, you're going to be found guilty. And they're like, no, 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 no. I'm such a cocky mother effer. I'm going to get myself out of this. And they never do. No, I've never heard of anyone defending themselves and then getting off. Right. Like, Ted Bundy defended himself, did not get off. I mean, he escaped multiple times, whatever, but he didn't get off. Uh, Freaking, what's his face from the other night? What's his dang name? What day around? Ten. It was day it was eight, eight, right? Yeah. What was eight? They're oh all just gosh, running together. Cases. They're running together. Whatever his name was. Doesn't really matter. He was the um, dating game killer. Yeah. What's El, his fucking El Capoe? name? No. Rodney Alcala. Richard. Rodney Alcala. Yeah. Yeah. Rodney Alcala. Hold my beer. Gets himself freaking thrown in jail until he's dead. Yeah, and now we've got- every time. And now we've got Milton Johnson. And so he goes to trial. He defends himself and they find him not guilty. What? I'm just kidding. That's an app. <laughs> That's not what happened. Let's get back into it. I can tell the annoyance on your face. Yes, I am annoyed. Okay. So obviously, first of all, the judge is concerned about Milton defending himself. He makes the public defenders stay on as consultants because he's concerned that if Milton defends himself later, he'll be able to appeal it. I don't, I, I don't know. Maybe state by state's different, but I thought if you defended yourself, then you had to waive all rights of an appeal, but I could be wrong. I have no idea. Well, that's what I thought. Um, I could be wrong. I don't know. I could be wrong. But maybe it varies state by state. So anyway, the public defenders have to stay on as consultants. Milton obviously does a shit job defending himself. He had no opening or closing argument at all. Like, he just that's did a shit job. Part of a defense. What are you doing? No, he didn't have one. So obviously he's found guilty once again. And so again, he's sentenced to death. So now he's got two death sentences. Um, Milton Johnson was never tried for the murders of Sergeant Dennis Foley. Deputy Stephen Mayer, Kathleen Norwood, Richard Paulin, or George Keel. Um, he also was never tried for the attempted murder of Laura Troutman. He was never tried for the murders of Honor uh, Lehman or Zeta Bloom or Kenneth Chancellor or Terry Johnson. The prosecutors did not believe that there was enough evidence in those cases to return a guilty verdict, and they were happy with the two death, death penalties that they had gotten. Uh, unfortunately, Milton Johnson did appeal a number of times, and while his trials were never overturned, he was able to ride it out long enough for the state of Illinois to ban the death penalty. Therefore, his sentences were then transitioned into life sentences with the possibility of parole. So he did escape the death penalty with his appeals. Well, he tried. He tried. Um, he didn't deserve to try, but he tried. Uh, as far as I can tell, Milton Johnson is still in prison. Uh, he would now be 72 years old. Couldn't find any update on him. Uh, but anyway, now I want to talk about uh, the next little tidbit of this is um, everything you read says he has 10 confirmed victims, but that does not math. No, he does not. I don't understand. I just told you about like 20 victims. Is that how many it was? Because I lost count. I lost count, too, honestly. I don't know. But even if. OK, so even if they're only referring to like the 10 confirmed being so they're saying like there's 10 confirmed. The only people that he was convicted of are the four in the flower shop. And then you've got Anthony Hawkins. And Patricia Payne. So that makes six. And then you've got like his first victim from the 70s. That makes seven. But even if you're only talking murdered, he was only convicted of five murders. Right. So I don't know how they're coming up with 10. It says like 10 plus, but he was only convicted of five. So I don't understand the math. I really don't. I don't, I don't get that. I don't know. But I mean, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I mean, he had so many victims. Like he, okay. So he had all the people that he killed. So let's just do a real quick recap. Um initially he followed that woman home so that's mm -hmm. one victim he stalked you then had the other lady later on who he also followed she got his license plate so he stalked at least two women just with that um he's got the first woman that he raped and attacked back in the 70s so that's three victims right there i mean if we want to count all of his victims because i would say those stalking victims are victims too yes. so that's three uh fresh out of prison he killed those two old sisters followed by that he killed 
the adulterers. Followed by that, it was the five other people. Followed by that was the four. I missed. No, I missed the other two. I don't know. I'm losing count again. You're at 18. 18. Yeah. So about 20, almost 20 people. It's insane. I, I'm, I don't know. He really is a real trash bag. I don't know. And I still don't understand the 10. I don't know what I was getting into. When when we picked that case, I did not know that's what I was getting into. You know, I think I picked um a good odd. My odd cases seem to be going pretty well for me. Your even cases, they're kind of crazy. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, All I right. don't know. That's crazy. I don't know. Well, on that note, um, let's cut and uh, we are got to go record episode. We got to go record day 11. We got to go. All right. Well, thanks for that. I'll see yeah. you in um, two seconds. We'll see the rest of you tomorrow when we cover 11 eyeball pluckings. I'm excited for this one. <laughs> well, don't get too excited. <laughs> okay. See you tomorrow. That's all, folks. Bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard and want to support a small podcast, please give us money at www.patreon.com forward slash weekly dose of wicked, where you can join one of our three tiers. At the $5 level, we've got the moderately wicked. For $7 a month, we've got the awesomely wicked. And for all of those high rollers, big ballers out there, we got the $10 level, the extraordinarily wicked. As a member of our Patreon, you are entitled to bonus episodes. Uh, you also get a one-time shout out on our podcast, as well as some other cool little extra things going on there. So come on over, join our fan club. Feel free to give us a follow on Instagram at weekly underscore dose underscore of underscore wicked or you can literally just search weekly dose of wicked and we'll pop up because we're the only ones for a direct feed of our podcast please go to www.weeklydoseofwicked.buzzsprout.com great news you can now listen to us pretty much wherever you like to listen to podcasts that's right, folks. We are big time. You can now hear your weekly dose of Wicked on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Plus Alexa, Podcast Addict, Podchaser, Pocket Cast, Deezer, Listen Notes, Player FM, Podcast Index, Overcast, Castro, Castbox, and Podfriend. The only place we can't seem to get ourselves on is Pandora. So we'll let you know when that happens. In the meantime, make sure to come back next Wednesday for your weekly, weekly dose, dose of, of wicked. wicked. But um. Psh.